Good morning, everybody. A pleasure also for me to be back at Ars Electronica after six years. I see that everything is still working perfectly fine, the same setup, the same idea of familiarity. And it's also a pleasure to be able today to speak to you and therefore uh, uh, give you one of the biggest cliches for design, which is Charles and Ray Eames. Since this is a different audience, I don't feel bad about it. Charles and Ray Eames used to say that everything was about connections, connections and connections, and they were arguably the first multimedia information designers of the 20th, uh, 20th century. So it's great to hear that Adam sees in this particular secret that these uh, 3D and 2D and 5D designers had already understood. He sees the key to a new era for the overview effect. Designers are fundamental when it comes to reach this new overview effect based on connectivity. Why? Because designers are what makes any kind of data set and any kind of analysis understandable. I believe that analysis is not easy, but still can be learned. You know, you can follow a method, but synthesis requires much more. Synthesis requires leap of faith, leap of understanding, and an instinctual sense of the elegance of communication. I'm here to argue for elegance. Elegance, which is not beauty and prettiness, but that is the intention to make things, data, ideas, not just understandable, but also appealing, that it's the elegance that tries to get under your skin and move you, maybe not like an Earth Day, but at least move you to act. That's what designers do, and that's why a big picture demands a strong point of view. Now, synthesis and, uh, and visualization elegance might also mean leaving something out. I'm going to go back also in history and show you the famous map by John Snow of 8055, the map that brought to the understanding of the spread of the epidemics of cholera in London by just looking at the different water pumps, one in particular in the east side, that the epidemics was concentrated on. John Snow is considered one of the first examples of visualization that also led to action and to understanding. Another one is Florence Nightingale's great diagram of the causes of mortality in the army in the East. She presented this analysis to Queen Victoria after having studied all the causes of death in the war in Crimea. What she understood is that the causes of death in black are by wounds, and the causes of death in red are by other causes related to wounds and related to the battle, while the blue areas are the causes of death related to what she called zymotic disease, which is a not used term anymore to talk about infections and bacteria. So she showed that by having an intervention by some medics on the field, an enormous amount of death could be avoided. She, uses a, she used a polar diagram, so a form that already existed of diagram, but it was so effective as to show the need for the kind of service that the Red Cross would in the future provide. One of the most famous maps of the 19th century is Charles Minard's map of Napoleon's cursed Russian campaign in 1812, where you can see from the dwindling of the Beige River, you can see the dwindling of the army that gets progressively destroyed and devastated by, by the cold, by famine, and very simply by being unable to deal with Russia. So it's amazing how narrative and synthesis and the choice of viewpoints that are also aesthetic are driving, driving the point home. Of course, one of the most famous examples of visualization of the 20th century is the map of London, in particularly Harry Beck map of London of 1931. What you see here is before Beck, when the map of the tube in London of the underground tried to mimic the actual geography of London, therefore making it impossible for anybody to understand where they should go. Harry Beck was a draftsman, a complete freelance draftsman, who decided to try uh, and make sense of that map. So instead of trying to mimic the geography, he took liberty. He's, he used diagonals and orthogonals and made it all much simpler, then went to the underground authority and said, let's try this. 
they gave it a try and the public loved it. All of a sudden it was adopted and it was celebrated everywhere. And it remained the same. Harry Beck was hired by the underground and the map remained the same until they included the Victoria Line a few years later and they made some minor changes. But it became really the model for subway maps all over the world. So much so that in 1972, Massimo Vignelli tried to do the same for the New York subway map. But in that case, it didn't work. It was not appreciated by New Yorkers and it was abandoned in 1979. Why? Because any kind of visualization has to deal with an audience. Any kind of visualization, just like any kind of three-dimensional, five-dimensional design, is about expressing something or giving a function that is open to many people. It always has an audience. In this case, London, London inhabitants were less familiar with the geography of their town than New Yorkers were. Therefore, Londoners appreciated a simplification. And instead, New Yorkers could not deal with somebody trying to redesign their very simple grid, their more walkable and easier city. So the audience rejected a visualization that simplified, not simplified too much, but that diagrammed too much. So once again, the success of a design is in how you decide to express your point of view, which is very interesting. Of course, visualizations don't always have to be designed in a way that is completely overt. They can be very simple. You're looking here at the uh, design of the diagram of the first Bauhaus courses by Johannes Eaton in 1923. So sometimes making sense also of cultural events can be driven by visualization. Culture is as complex as science. It has fewer data sets, but it has much more slippery concepts that can benefit from some sort of visualization. Visualization. And in fact, I'm showing here, uh, well, I'm from the Museum of Modern Art, so this is a stalwart of our museum. It's a diagram designed by the founding director of MoMA, Alfred Barr, to explain, if that is all possible, abstract art in 1936. We still use it. We still try to adapt it and update it. And the curators at MoMA still look to it as really an example of how to deal with it. Now, of course, this is not that designed. So that goes to tell you, when I say design, I don't mean fancy, I mean clear, I mean expressive, and an attempt to be visually understandable. We have seen from Johan's presentation that one of the biggest ways to try and make sense of complexity, or one of the ways to try and render the same kind of shock that was rendered by the photograph of the Earth, is to dive into human behavior. We've seen also some images from the, the Blue Brain Project from Switzerland that is just breathtaking. The human nature and human beings are still one of the most undiscovered secrets, and maybe it's the way to progress, progress in the future. You see here the famous diagram by Leonardo da Vinci, the Vitruvian Man. This was all about the proportions of the body, and in the 20th century, it was recuperated by Le Corbusier, the famous architect, to try and find a mediation between the imperial metric system and the decimal metric system. But already, it was way beyond proportions merely. It was also about a new way to inhabit the world and a new way to inhabit the cities. Now, you might say that today, the, the attempt to reproduce the nature of man is not anymore in dimensions, but it's in feelings. We've seen how Johan talked about it. And of course, one of the most well-known examples recently is We Feel Fine, the famous website by Jonathan Harris and Seth Kamvar that goes around the internet looking for iterations and case studies that have to deal with the word with the root feel and then renders them according to geography, renders them according to the tweets and according to the phrases where the feeling is found, renders them with the pictures that are connected to the feeling. I feel so much of my dad alive in me that there isn't even room for me. So all of these iterations with pictures and then gives them down as breakdowns in people in the last few hours or even connections between feelings and weather. So it's a different way to render 
a whole situation worldwide, terminating with a series of wobbly mounds. It's kind of nice to go on it online if you haven't done so. Wobbly mounds that show the most felt feelings in the world at any time. So this is not yet scientifically analyzed. It's really just a synthesis of what you can find on the internet, but it gives you a sense and many viewpoints of different locations and different moods all over the world. Now, I would like to, for, for a moment, show to you the importance of design, the importance of aesthetic intention in the work. We've seen before some work by Martin Wattenberg, and in this case, it's Martin together with Fernanda Viegas. Martin and Fernanda are amongst the most effective aesthetically and visually designers online um, in visualization. They take data sets that are available everywhere, but render them in a way that is at the same time compelling and clear. You see here an analysis over time of a Wikipedia entry, a quite controversial one, in this case, abortion. And you see that different colors are different authors that fight and correct each other, sometimes with spikes that are akin to almost like barb fights, you know, are almost like fist fights, to actually uh, stake their grounds on the definition of abortion. While this is a much more recent map, it's a dynamic map, which you might want to see online, a live wind map of the United States. So in this case, you can, the data set is completely reliable. You can really focus and zoom in and see more detail. But having this whole big picture of certain phenomena that is also rendered in an understandable and compelling way is extremely important. Ben Fry was amongst the first hailed great designers in visualization, also particularly respected because of his coding abilities, his scientific cred, and the fact that he was a co-author of Processing together with Casey Rias. But this is one of his first uh, projects, the Distella map from 2005, in which he took Atari games and tried to render the code by showing really the, not only the, the programming, you see that those loops are when, when the code says go back to, but also the interference of images, which are the orange blocks with the main data. So you get a first sense of the beauty of code, which is one of the secrets that I'm trying to crack these days. As a design curator, I always hear about the beauty of code, and I'm trying to really feel it and understand it. And this is one of the first examples that is understandable also by an ignoramus like me that doesn't really know how to code. Ben went on to work with the Nature magazine. This is a beautiful cover from 2008 in which by comparing the genetic set of three different populations, you can see the variations and the distances between these three populations. Of course, the data set is complex. The understanding requires a certain scientific knowledge and literacy, but nonetheless, the compelling image draws you to try and understand more, even if you don't know about it, while scientists are very satisfied because it's perfect the exact data. The um, influence of somebody like Ben has sparked a lot of emulation and a lot of inspiration. I wouldn't say emulation, but I, you know, Ben is one of the first um, examples coming out of the MIT Media Lab of Muriel Cooper's, the late Muriel Cooper School and then John Maida. One of the first examples that showed not only to engineers and not only to scientists, but also to designers, the database is a viable avenue for work, that there can be satisfaction, aesthetic and functional satisfaction in the work. Here, the work of Stephanie Pozovec with Greg McInerney in this case is a great example. You can also see different schools, like Stephanie uses a lot this organic sprouting of fractal uh, organic nature. This is uh, the, the comparison of six different editions of Darwin's work that show how Darwin corrected himself. So you see how he changed and how he actually amended his own work. At a site, an overview, and also you can go into more detail. Well, in this particular case, Stephanie is showing how she analyzes books. This is On the Road by Jack Kerouac. It's based on the iteration of certain words, on the divisions between chapters. Muriel Cooper is one of the first people that really taught designers how to do this. You know, she was, for instance, in the work of David Small, it was about the Talmud. It was about having this bird's eye or God's eye view of a work. But now it's become much more sophisticated and much more um, used and spread. 
Moritz Steffener, we've already heard about him, is uh, another great, great master of visualization design. And his work ranges from really seriously um, scientifically based work. For instance, this is a collaboration with, with Eigenfactor project. Eigenfactor is a metrics company. And based on data coming from Thomson Reuters, they analyzed 60 million citations in scientific journals and tried to connect them to each other. So it's a way to analyze one of the overlaid networks that are on the internet. So his work ranges from something so deep and so important to instead this work that he did for My Muesli, which is a German company that provides you personalized, customized muesli. You can uh, order it online. And this he tried to show the different connections and how clients of My Muesli put together different muesli ingredients. And here you have the iterations of the muesli. So it's nice also to see how this kind of work can be at the same time deep and facetious and can really give new insights. This particular insight, for instance, goes back to the campaign, the presidential campaign in the US of 2008, and it shows how much more money McCain had at the beginning at a certain point and how in the end, instead, Obama, by using really the grassroots effort, was able to gain more uh, money. In this particular case, the visualization, I would like to say, which is by Pitch Interactive, is gorgeous but not immediately understandable. So it's interesting how a curator like me that's used to dealing with other forms of design is always looking for a balance. I'm always looking for a balance between a function that is really well rendered and a beautiful expression of it that is also innovative, that uses new technology, that pushes the world a little further, that adds something to the world that was missing today before and that is now really valid. I do the same for visualization. I believe that also visualization takes space. It might take less resources, but it does take space. So I like to see the efforts in the visualization community to try and get to a better, purer, and a stronger way to uh, express concepts. Josh On and they rule the site for 2004 is a great example of minimalism. There's minimalism in data viz as well. It was also one of the first instances in which the power of the internet was used to reveal data and to reveal connections. We're talking again about, again about connections that before were almost secret. In this case, J Josh took some of the main corporate boards in the United States and showed the connections between these boards and different parts of the government of the United States. So in a way showed the conflicts of interest, showed the, uh, you know, the golf games or the backroom games that people did not know about before. It was really powerful and scared the bejesus out of many in the corporate world. And similarly, now today, of course, we have much more sophisticated tool, but we have a lot of political application of visualization design. I'm showing to you here Diller's Cathedral and Renfro together with Ear Studio visualization for an exhibition that Paul Virilio did at the Fondation Cartier about um, uh, four years ago that was all based on the idea that humanity today is defined by migrations. So it was a visualization in six movements, as if it were a concert, in a really big circular theater. Well, really big. Let's say 12 meters diameter, really big. 12 meter diameter theater that showed different examples of how people have moved around the world in the past century because of natural disasters, because of political disasters, and also showed the effect of some of these movements. What you're seeing here, for instance, is just a visualization of the movements. But here you see the remittances. So it was kind of beautifully choreographed with the sound of ka-ching every time one country sent the money back to another country. But it really shows how the economy, the world economy, is shaken and stirred by big movements and how different countries contribute different uh, amount of money to others. You see here, you have a sense of the theater here, but another important visualization was the one that showed different movements around the world because of genocide. You're, sh you're seeing here, for instance, in 1996, what happened in Congo, where so many people moved to different parts of Africa and then to the rest of the world because of the civil war there. And you see it better here. Altogether, having 
the world rotate around the theater every single time the visualization changed, connected strangely this particular effort to what Adam was talking about before, to the overview effect. What happened in the 70s has stayed with us, and that perspective of the world as a gorgeous marble that contains so much has, in a way, helped us understand that that is our limit, but that is also our new frontier. And maybe we have to look inward, analyze our data, analyze our behavior, analyze our brain, in order to get to that second reckoning and that second revealing moment. And I would like to show one example of this. I like to always show this work, not only because it is gorgeous, but also because I've seen the effect that it has on people. It, it's a work done by a mix of designers and architects at Columbia University in the Spatial Information Design Lab, which is part of the architectural school. It takes data coming from the government of the United States that talks about certain blocks in cities of the United States where the government, whether local or federal government, spends a certain amount of money every year, more than a million dollars, to either keep some of the inhabitants in prison or to keep them in halfway houses anyway, outside of society. So in a way, it's almost like a measure of entropy. It's a measure of what the government does to confine and not reinsert into society certain individuals. It's amazing to find out that there are more than 300 of these blocks in Brooklyn alone. And it's data that is quite incredible because you can think of the expense, you can think of the human waste, you can think of the entropy of society getting progressively corroded with expense. But if you read it in figures on a newspaper in the morning, you can get outraged for 20 minutes and then forget about it. But here come the designers, and all of a sudden they use some of the most expressive and scary colors, you know, red on black. And they show you how many of these blocks exist in Brooklyn alone, and all of a sudden, you cannot forget it. It stays with you, and it really influences the way you think about it. So you look and you compare, because it's not only about the blocks, it's also about using the same colors to show the correlation. This is a crime density map in Brooklyn, New York. And this is instead a prison admission density map in Brooklyn, New York, that is then followed by a prisoner migration patterns map. So all of a sudden you see crime, imprisonment, and then reinsertion or not reinsertion. And the reason why I find this kind of visualization so important is because at MoMA we have programs that deal with you know, convicts and also with kids, with youth that is in halfway houses or in juvenile detention systems. And I've seen them come to MoMA, come to this lofty, amazing place where so much of the best production of humanity exists, and stop in front of the Million Dollar Blocks project and be completely stunned to see themselves on the wall, to see their own story so elegantly and so effectively portrayed. You know, Gollan was talking about the fact that one of the first tools and one of the first effects of visualization is to give a mirror of ourselves, to let us see ourselves in ways that we were never able to see ourselves before. And Indeed, that's what designers do best. By using these kind of tools, by using elegance and intention and what they have learned along many years to make sure that the data that scientists, st statisticians, and politicians have so labored on really get home and influence the population at large. So, as I always say, designers on top. Thank you very much.